Um, on the first Metal Massacre record, uh, the one that famously uh, features Metallica, um, the the band's name is famously misspelled. Oh, it's- not just the band's name. I mean, the band's name is misspelled. Ron McGovern's ma- name is misspelled. Lloyd Grant's <laughs> name is, mis- is misspelled. So here's why. So we go old school here. And for any of you people out there that aren't old enough to know what a typesetter is, go Google it. But back then, basically, you'd give all the information to somebody who would, would do typesetting, and that would be where how the stuff would look on a record. Uh, and, and I had all the credits and everything for everything else really early, so I was able to kind of go through and proofread it and, uh, and give it to the typesetter so it was clear and she could see it. Well, the Metallica song, they, we had a, a, a deadline of uh, 5 o'clock, whatever the day it was, of February something or other in, in 82. And we told Lars, like, if you, you have to have it here to the studio where we're, ma- where we're mastering it by 3 o'clock or whenever it was. So, you know, it's like 2.30 and he's not there yet. So we're almost like, I mean, there. And we were like, if he didn't make it, he's not going to make it on the record. So he showed up the last minute, you know, with a, first of all, with a cassette tape. Um, and we needed it on a, on a reel-to-reel tape, so we had to bump it up 50 bucks. Nobody had 50 bucks. Thankfully, John Quinnerans, my friend who was helping me with all this stuff, had 50 bucks. Otherwise, they might not have been on that record. But he gave me a paper with all the information on it that he had written out, not so clearly. And I didn't really have time because we literally had to drive, drive that straight to the to the uh, typesetter right after it was basically being done at that time. So I guess when she saw everything, it wasn't printed very well, number one. Number two, Metallica is not a word. So I guess she felt that there should be two T's in there because maybe that's how the, the you know English works for her. I don't know. but And then he had misspelled the other stuff just because, you know, you, M- McGovney, V, look like a U. And, yep. and I don't know how she screwed up boy. But yeah, I got, I got the album. I was like, this is so great. I put out a record. I can't believe it. And I turn it around. I'm like, oh my God, this is my <laughs> Well, it's also the last uh, last song on the on the record. Yeah, I think we they had uh I mean it's for two reasons. Number one, because we, you know, it, when we were mastering it, we kind of had to make it the last song because it came in so late. Yeah. But I think that Lars wanted it. I, I believe he said, I want this to be the last song on the record. Uh so I was like, all right. I mean, I hadn't heard anything up until then, by the way. I hadn't heard anything. Didn't know what it was gonna sound like. Didn't wow. know anything. He's just, he's just my friend and said, if I can if I put together a band, could I be on your record? I'm like, sure. So that's how Metallica started, obviously. And I wasn't sure what it sounded like. Uh, because even that day when we had to bump it up, we had to leave, I had to leave again because of the typesetter. So I never even heard that track until the record was done. Wow. Wow. Oh. And Remind- so Remind just, us all where this was recorded. Do you recall where they were Lars and yeah, them? So they, they, they used something called a Fostex, which is this little yeah. probably oh, this big device with a cassette, like four tracks. Yeah. Uh, I think they recorded in Lars' bedroom, probably a garage yeah. or something like that. Wow. Yeah. So, so just to be clear, Metallica basically doesn't exist at this point. Lars yeah. shows up with a tape of a band of guys that he put together specifically to submit a track to your record. Yeah, so the, the the story goes that, you know, Lars was trying to get in a band and wasn't having any success, and he had jammed with James a couple of times because James had a band called Leather Charm, but they didn't really think Lars was very good because, I mean, honestly, he wasn't very good at the time. He was still learning. But Lars went back to him and said, hey, I have an opportunity to be on a record, which in 1980, well, it was late 81, the record came out in 82. That was a huge thing. Like, being on a record was, you know, it just doesn't happen back then. Nice. So James is like, oh, we can be on a record? Then, yeah, for sure, let's do it. And, you know, they're very nice and kind to me and always mention that story that, you know, Metallica might not have ever existed if it wasn't for that. So, I mean, you know, That's- whatever. I mean, it, it's nice that they say that. I, I, I would like to hope that they would have done something, but I'm happy to play my, my little role in it. I think that's one of the cool things about your story is that you were, you know, not only instrumental in helping these bands get started, but all these years later, you're still, you're, you're personal friends with them. This wasn't some sort of one-time business transaction and then they got famous and forgot you. Um, you're still friendly with these guys. And I think that speaks volumes about their character and probably also speaks to to a degree to the metal community at large. There's a certain loyalty when you do something, uh, they tend not to forget it. And but I mean, we're talking about the biggest band ever when in the case of Metallica. 
And I think it's really cool that they've never forgotten you. Uh, they still they they still consider you a friend. They still give you your credit where credit is due. And then, you know, in the same breath, I'm going to add that Carrie King wrote the foreword to your latest book, Swing of the Blade. Uh, again, that goes to show this certain loyalty, this appreciation that's never died. I think that's a remarkable part of your story. Yeah, and Lars wrote the uh, the forward to the first book, which was cool. So, yeah, it's, Carrie's funny because Carrie's like one of my really good friends, and uh, you know, we've raided tickets together. And I, I saw him about a week ago; he was here in Vegas. So, such a good dude. But you know, I, I didn't. I, I always feel odd asking people, like even with Lars. I, I don't think I asked him. I think I went to Cupron and said, "Hey, do you think Lars could do that?" I don't want to ask him directly. Same thing with Carrie. Like I, I didn't want to ask because he's not that kind of guy that does that sort of stuff, right? So mm -hmm. I went to management and said, hey, uh, can you ask Curry who wants to do this? And he said, sure, obviously. He's such a good guy. He's really, he's also, a, you know, he's got the image out there, you know, Mr. You know, mean and all this yeah. stuff. He's like the sweetest right. guy ever. And he said, he did the forward and he sent it to me, you know, text, text it, texted it to me and said, what do you think? I go, dude, this is amazing. They're like, really? Are you sure? I'm going, it's phenomenal. Thank you so much. So yeah, He kind of uh, admitted, he kind of admitted that he, it kind of was like, not uncomfortable, but it's not, you know, in, in the forward, he's even being honest saying, you know, I don't even, where do I start? How do I do yeah. this kind of a vibe, which makes it authentic. Yeah. He's not that, he's not that kind of guy, but I was kind of thinking, you know, when I'm doing this book, it's like, well, first of all, you know, cause I know that people could do us, you know, I'm good friends with Chris Jericho. I mean, I'm trying to get him to do it, but I kind of want to keep it in the metal blade family. And yeah. I threw out some other names, and I just like, oh, it'd be really cool, you know. I mean, Lars did the first one, so you got to follow it up with, you know, somebody halfway decent. So right. uh, I figured, you know, if Carrie would be perfect because I, you know, obviously we have the, the relationship with Slayer in the early days, and he, he's still a very good friend of mine. So uh, I'm, luckily he did it. But it's funny, I asked him the other when I was with him the other day. I said, I got to do the audio book. Uh, do you want to read your part? He's like, nah, I'm not doing that. I go, okay, I'll get John Bush to do it. He, he's, he's. He did a bunch of the first book. So he's like, that that guy, he's like, yeah, he's perfect. He's got a good voice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, Bush. Bush nice. is but, awesome. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I first of all, with, with like bands like Slayer and Metallica, he was the early bands, you know, we're, we're just, we're all, we're all just fans from that, that time frame. And, you know, I'm happy that, you know, I'm friends with, you know, not only just bands that were on Metal Blade, but, you know, the Anthrax guys are really good friends of mine, you know. So many bands are, and it's just it's very. It's because we're all we're all metal fans, and we're all in this in this community together. And you know, ninety eight, ninety nine percent of all of everybody's are, they're really great people, and we're all you know we share that love of metal, and, and especially a lot of guys that came up. You know, it, it's funny because there's a, these different dynamics. You know, a lot of a lot of friends came up at the same time I did, so we're the same age, so we're the same same you know bands we discovered early on and whatnot but then you have the other guys like for example uh johan the singer from amana marth as i'm wearing the shirt today is also a very a very close friend of mine as well and you know he's about 10 years yeah, about 10 years younger than i am and so it's just interesting to hear hear his trajectory and you know what got him into metal and what were the gateways because you know a lot of a lot of these guys had like when i was there what well, wasn't really a gateway necessarily it was just you know Right, at the classic stuff, but for you know guys that are a little bit younger, there's the gateway bands they first heard that got them down there. So it's really interesting. But I, but it oh, just to wrap up real quick, it's just it's you know I like to work with people that I get along with. Uh, I don't want to work with people that are a headache or have you know drug problems or you know any sort of problems. So we've been pretty lucky over the years. We haven't had dealt with too many of those issues, and you know I'm I'm happy to say. You know, almost every band on the label are all good friends of mine that I that you know I, I have enough contact with. So that's which yeah. is great. I think too, there's another shared camaraderie among you and the bands that you signed, and that is this: a lot of the music that you brought to the world for the first time was in a, in many many ways very unprecedented. We didn't hear bands like Metallica or Slayer uh, in the early '80s when this stuff. I remember thinking that it just couldn't get heavier than Iron Maiden, you know? Yeah. And then, so, so there's this brotherhood among you all that you started something and it took over the world. You stuck it to the man and you did it on your own terms out of a basement somewhere and look at us now. And I think if you share that experience with somebody, you don't forget it. A hundred percent. And, you know, all of us, you know, people ask, the, we always ask, get, get asked the question, do you ever see, think that any of this would be, 
as big as it is. And there's at, back in the early days, no, no way. There's no way. I mean, none of us thought any of this was would ever be as big as as this whole thing has, has got. We were just we were just fans of the music, and we were just doing whatever we could to you know try to promote or play or whatever the music that we love. We didn't really think about making money or think about selling a lot of records. We're just like, we're just try, trying to make enough money to, to try to survive, which, you know, was not easy for a lot of us. Um, but we did it because we loved it. And then, you know, the fact that it, it has become successful. And I think it took a while, you know, you, have, you talk about Metallica and even, and even Slayer. It's like, it took a while for those bands to get really big. So it wasn't like they were, you know, all of a sudden thrust into the spotlight, which, you know, some other bands have, and they may have, you know, fame may have changed them. Well, these guys took a while for them to, to get to that point. I think that, like, if Metallica would have had that crazy, you know, it would have been massive right away, and maybe it would have been a little bit of a different story, but it took them a while, so they, they appreciate it. 